Oh, hey, didn't see you there. See, I'm about to make a choice, and I'm brinking terrified. No matter the size or scale of the decision I have to make, every single choice I ever make will impact my long-term life in ways I could never prepare for. Much like how in 2022, the most perfect video game company, Nintendo, made the decision to shut down their online eShop for 3DS and Wii U. With you unable to add funds through mommy's credit card on those consoles in May 2022, through daddy's binder of eShop cards in August 2022, and no longer to download anything you haven't bought as of March of 2023. Now, this decision was bound to happen eventually. Nintendo, as we all know, is a company and is therefore evil. And at some point, the Wii U and 3DS eShops were gonna cost more to keep the servers up than they would be making off of people buying Pushmo. Now, most of the games in the 3DS's library have physical copies, but there are still some fantastic games that can no longer be bought and played legally as the eShop shut down. Games like Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix, Pushmo! and Pokemon Picross, which really hope you got that one. But among all of these legally inaccessible pieces of gaming, there is a definitive version from one of Nintendo's staple franchises, Fire Emblem Fates Revelations, the definitive version of the Fire Emblem Fates series on 3DS. Fire Emblem Fates Revelations is quite possibly the weirdest Fire Emblem Fates game, which is already the weirdest set of Fire Emblem games, only possibly excluding the mobile game and the Shin Megami Tensei one, which I was told was a dating sim. It's actually less dating sim than the normal games. So if you don't happen to know, Fire Emblem is a turn-based tactics strategy RPG based in a high fantasy setting, or if you played Three Houses, a high school fantasy setting. For the main gameplay, think Advance Wars, but with boobs. If you haven't played Advance Wars, think Dungeons and Dragons based combat, but if you got to control your entire party. Also with boobs. If you haven't played either of those, it's kind of like chess. In Fire Emblem games, if you lose a unit in combat, they permanently die, and you can't use them for the entire rest of the story, leading to a lot of replayability, memorable moments, and a different way of thinking about your units. This permadeath mechanic is a Fire Emblem staple, which as of New Mystery of the Emblem for the DS, was made an optional mode to actually get people to play the game. Which was a pretty big issue, because in the early 2000s, nobody was playing it anymore, despite having three Smash Brothers reps. Now that's a yikes. With the series starting to underperform, the big boss told Intelligent Systems that if the next Fire Emblem game didn't sell well, the entire series was done. And considering the previous game sold the second worst in the entire series, they were like, well, let's go out with a big bang. But the bang was actually so big that they ended up making Fire Emblem Awakening, one of the most polished and popular Fire Emblem games ever. Full of tons of fun characters, new gimmicks, tons of character interactions, an interesting story, unit customization, DLC, hot digital girlfriends, it had it all, including two more Smash reps. But with most of their ideas exhausted into Awakening, Intelligent System now had to find a premise for their new game, and they decided to give us something the world's never seen before. And that brings us to Fire Emblem Fates, one game with three versions, one of which is DLC for the other ones, while all being sold and treated as their own complete game. Is this a riddle? It's very hard to describe Fire Emblem Fates because as far as I know, there's not another set of games that does what this series does with its versions. This is a shooting star. It's not like Pokemon's versions where each game is near identical with the versions of the games being mostly interchangeable. Not a single property other than Pokemon could get away with that. Rest in peace, Yokai Watch. It's not a new addition to replace or enhance or add on to an old game like a typical Legacy or HD or Legendary Edition. It's three full-length Fire Emblem games, each with their own unique stories, playable characters, classes, maps, and features, while still all having identical beginnings, overlapping stories, characters, classes, maps, and features. Ah, a living contradiction. The closest thing I could describe Bates versions to are to treat each game as a different story path in the same story, much like Three Houses, Three Houses. In fact, to me, Fates feels thematically like a weird beta mix of Three Houses and Awakening. 
The routes are where the three stories divide, except here your first route costs $40 and gives you the option to buy the other two for $20 each. No matter which version of Fates you get, all the games start the exact same way. You create a self-insert character whose canonical name is Corrin from Smash Brothers. You live as a noble from the royal family of Nor, which is a kingdom where it's always nighttime for some reason, is a literal hole in the ground, and is meant to represent Europe. It all makes sense now. In your home of Nor, you also have many wonderful loving siblings, like Xander, who's cool, powerful, and confident, Leo, who's always got something to prove, Elise, who's a lolly, and Camilla, who is your sister. You and your siblings get into some sitcom-like shenanigans, like Leo getting embarrassed when he had his collar inside out, or when your dad forces you to execute prisoners of war. It did what Family Matters was too afraid to do. Though you may have many wonderful, loving siblings and servants, Nor also is home to some more nefarious and comically evil members of its community, much like Europe. Most notably, your dad, King Garen, who attempts to have you killed three times before the seventh chapter of the game. During one of those attempts to kill Corrin, you end up getting kidnapped by the next-door rival kingdom of Hoshido, a kingdom of peace and love, and just full of cherry blossom trees. And notably, is above ground. The theme of this game is Japan good, Europeans are fuckers. Here you learn that you were actually born as part of the Hoshiden royal family and were surprise adopted by King Garen as a child after he killed your real dad. You also learn of your new loving Hoshiden siblings. You have Ryoma, who's cool, powerful, and confident. Takumi, who's always got something to prove. Sakura, who's a lolly, and Hanoka, who very much exists. Your older siblings confess about how their entire lives revolved around your disappearance, and Corrin's just like, I don't know who you are. Corrin, unsure if these guys are being truthful or not, decides to just chill there for a while and find out. And during a celebration to show how Corrin is not at all a threat to Hoshido, Corrin indirectly bombs the capital. Well, that's gonna make things awkward at the dinner table. Corrin's anger at this event turns them into a dragon, because Corrin is also part demigod dragon. You know, I think it also would have been, like, really cool if they gave Corrin the ability to, like, control shadows and, like, could ch like choke people out with their own shadows and uh, a chainsaw sword, but it's made out of, like, rainbow light. And also, like, if they had, like, a, an M4A1. You would think that Corrin turning into a dragon is, like, a big deal, something that nobody has ever really seen before, something that shows Corrin's uniqueness and power, and could give Corrin a mystery to solve about themselves. Because up until this point, they also didn't know that they could turn into a dragon. But no, nobody cares outside of this one scene. Not your new siblings, not your old siblings. In all three games, it's brought up again three times. In a throwaway piece of dialogue and conquest, in an optional paralogue, and in a DLC pack. Hey dad, look what I learned I can do. You always were full of surprises, son. By the way, your sister wants pizza tonight. I just think they needed something for his upbeat in Smash Brothers and figured turning into a dragon would be pretty cool. After Corrin kills the invisible water ghost humanoid monsters that bombed the city with a sword given to Corrin by his dad from another country, they could have leaked the script on fanfiction.net and nobody would have believed it was real. Corrin gets chosen by the legendary divine sword Yato that proves that they are destined to be a hero and are very unique and special. As if turning into a dragon could not convey that. But they can't focus on all these legendary events, because now that Korin's mom is dead, she can no longer keep up the magical spell around Hoshido that causes people to lose the will to fight, and Nor is on their way to attack. We go to the battle alongside our new Hoshiden friends and family, and see none other than our old Norian friends and family. So now, here comes the big choice. Who do you want to side with? Who do you want to risk having to kill? Which path is yours to take? Depending on which path you choose, you will be sent down a different game entirely. And all anime silliness aside, I think this is an amazing premise for a game. Having to pick between fighting alongside Hoshido, fighting against everyone you've known and grown up with, and who raised you due to a controlling evil tyrant of a father who stole you away from your birth family as well as committed many atrocities across every nation in Fire Emblem Fates Birthright. 
or siding with the people you grew up with and trust and know are good people and having to find a way to remove the king from the inside to avoid hurting those who you care about while also having to fight the people you know are morally in the right in Fire Emblem Fates Conquest. And I feel like, in a way at least, the aspects of the game you pick, whether intentional or not, is reflected in Korn's choice. The Birthright route is a lot more straightforward. You go and fight a comedically evil kingdom and try to dethrone the king who killed your dad and your mom and your grandpa butler guy that was on his own side and you, almost. For Corrin, this choice to me seems like the most logical, while also being the most generic, much like the game it's in. Birthright is a pretty easy, basic, and the least interesting Fire Emblem game I have ever played. Many of the story beats felt less impactful as they did in Conquest or Revelations, whether that has to do with a less suspenseful plot due to it lacking elements of secrecy or urgency the other route stories have, or even if the threats don't seem as threatening because when you go into the maps, they're just a lot easier. It's just a basic hero with sword, go beat the bad guy story. The main thing setting it apart from other Fire Emblem games is the overall Japanese theme rather than the normal medieval Europe vibe, and the conflict with the Norian siblings who, I do admit, add some of the most memorable scenes and moments from all of Birthright. A lot of people say Birthright is a good place to start when it comes to modern Fire Emblem, and I say, sure. Birthright's not brain dead easy, there are still some tough spots if you don't know how units work or play in extremely unoptimal ways. While giving you places to grind and some interesting characters, there can still be a lot to learn because the game is in this genre. I feel gross just saying it. The Fire Emblem Fates wiki has more pages than Love and War. And Birthright being easy isn't necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes having to constantly reset back to the start of the map can be beyond frustrating, especially when some maps can take upwards of 30 minutes. It can be fun just to watch your anime characters say their critical hit quotes and do huge damage against a ton of enemies. Birthright isn't a terrible game, it's just basic. And if you're new and want to check out Fates, Birthright is the most new player friendly of the three. Out of all the Fire Emblem games I've played though, Awakening seems to be the best for keeping new players interested, engaged, and not being overly difficult. Plus, the writing is just so much better. I'd say Awakening is probably the best place to start if you can, which is starting to seem less likely. But for those who already know the Fire Emblem ropes, or are just Europe sympathizers, I'd recommend Fire Emblem Fates Conquest. Much like Birthright being a generic, somewhat boring but safe game to match with Korin's choice of Hoshido, Nor's Conquest Route is an interesting and very difficult game. With money and XP being limited since there's nowhere to grind outside of the story maps, paralogues, and potential DLC maps, where there are some specifically meant for grinding money and XP, if you're like me and are bad at the game and too stubborn to lower the difficulty setting. Conquest's increased difficulty may be to represent the harshness of Nor as a kingdom, the complexity of you unable to directly fight your true enemy for the majority of the game, and the difficulty of Korin having to fight against all of Hoshido, who they believe did nothing wrong, while also having the Norian higher-ups constantly planning your downfall. Many people ask, why would Korin go back to the kingdom ruled by the man who tried to kill them? three times. From a character standpoint, probably because that's where the only home and family Korin ever knew was. From a story standpoint, it's just so much more interesting. Everything about Conquest is just more entertaining. The maps have a lot more variety and objectives that change the way you go about the maps, and are just straight up hard. Even on casual mode, some of these maps are terribly challenging, with Chapter 10 being considered one of the hardest and best maps in Fire Emblem history. It's the Fire Emblem map I've lost on the most over the years, but I've only really played from Awakening onward. I have 20 years of games to catch up on, and every time I'm in a Walmart, they don't have a Famicom in stock. The characters in Conquest also just feel so much more fun, like Arthur, the justice-seeking, good-natured hero wannabe who the universe has a vendetta on for some reason. Yeah. Nyx, a talented dark mage who after committing a horrible atrocity was gifted with eternal youth, something that seemed like a blessing she later learned was a special kind of torment. 
and Charlotte, a brutal, harsh girl boss warrior from a penniless family who constantly tries to make herself look vulnerable and helpless to attract a rich or noble husband to give her family a more wealthy lifestyle. In fact, I feel that Conquest even does a better job at showing off Hoshido's characters than Birthright. In Birthright, there's not a lot of focus on the Hoshiden royals. Besides Ryoma and a whole possession arc thing with Takumi, they don't do much. Especially Hanoka, which was really surprising because in Conquest, Hanoka was one of the royals I found the most interesting. She showed up a lot and was pretty involved in the story of Conquest, though through most of Revelations and Birthright, she just spends most of the time by herself playing Flappy Bird. There's actually a theory floating around that Ryoma's retainer, Kajiro, was supposed to be the older sister, but they swapped her role with Hanoka last minute. But there's also that a lot of her personality is based off of learning to become a warrior to get her stolen sibling back. So if you chose Hoshido, her life goal is completed. She can retire. I feel like Conquest was the game intelligence systems wanted to make, but it just wouldn't make as much sense without the choice to fight alongside Hoshido. I don't know if that's true and that thought process is completely unjustified. Besides that, Conquest just feels like it had a lot more love put into it. But regardless if it's true or not, even if Birthright isn't your cup of tea as a game itself, I feel like its very existence and contrast to Conquest just enhance Conquest as a game. With such big differences in experiences per route, the integral decision of Nora or Hoshido could honestly be one of the biggest in-game decisions in gaming history. However, that choice is COMPLETELY undermined since you have to decide your choice before before you play the game, as your choice is dependent on which game you bought. Now, this decision is just clearly a cash grab, and honestly, makes this choice feel like a joke. Which sucks, because this decision is just so cool! Like, why make one game that's three games with one as DLC, when the entire premise is this big choice you make when you buy the box? Why did they not just put all three routes on one cartridge? Oh wait! They did! The Fire Emblem Fates Special Edition, which was a limited release that launched when Birthright and Conquest did, had all three versions even before Revelations was able to be downloaded on the eShop. It also came with an art book and 3DS case, all for $80. Oh, how the times change. Now that the eShop is closed, buying one of these or a 3DS with the game downloaded onto it will be the only way of playing the normally $20 DLC path Fire Emblem Fates Revelations legitimately and legally, like any good citizen would do. Fire Emblem Revelations is the oddest of the bunch, because you couldn't buy it as its own game like the other two. Revelations is a weird conglomeration of the other two games. It has nearly every playable character from them, with some minor exceptions. It adds the special grinding maps from Birthright, while tries to get closer in map design to Conquest, but still often comes up short with many of the maps feeling very gimmicky or are just annoying rather than more challenging. Revelation's premise is instead of making a tough, life-changing decision, you just decided not to. And by indulging in centricism, you get a golden canonical ending with all of your friends from both sides. You get to learn about the water ghost people that killed your mom, and about how the conflict between Nor and Hoshido is actually being influenced by a mentally insane dragon eyeball god who wants to erase humanity that you have to destroy. I think we're gonna need that rainbow chainsaw sword after all. Oh, thank God. So, as you can maybe tell, the Fates writing isn't great. The territories and allegiances in this story about war, which is kind of a big deal, aren't even there. Corrin is unconditionally loved by literally everyone for barely any reason and gets away with so much more than they should. Some people say Corrin being extremely naive is also a really big flaw, but Corrin's been locked away in a tower for like 10 years. I'm not surprised they don't make the best decisions all the time. There's also just a lot of things that don't make any sense at all, or are just very convenient. But most notably, in comparison to the other Fire Emblem games, this is... very anime. Like I'm talking sword art a lot. This anime-ness, and just bad writing in general, has helped give Fates the title of one of the worst Fire Emblem games ever. Now this is where the party's at! Unlike a lot of people, I don't feel like it being anime is an inherent flaw on the game or the series. 
I am known as Marth. Emblem Marth, to be clear. I changed my mom. Sure, the writing and storytelling is a confusing, overcomplicated, contradictory mess, and I won't argue against that. I don't think you can. But even when I know that it could have been done way better, I think it could still be enjoyed as a general story, even with all of Fate's writing's many faults. Or at worst, with how crazy and stupid this story can be, it can at least be laughed at for how much it doesn't make sense. Plus, there's so many elements of the writing that I find creative, fun, and engaging, specifically with some of the characters and their support conversations. Certain units can bond and gain extra stats and bonuses when next to each other or paired up on the map. As units' bond increases, you get access to these little support cutscenes, which can add a lot to the characters of these games. These characters may not be as fleshed out or realistic as some other entries, like Dorcas, a lot of these characters are very gimmicky and don't have much to them beyond their one given character trait, or in Camilla's case, two. Though I still love a lot of these characters, especially from Nor. They are all just so colorful and interesting or funny or cool. Plus, I feel like it may have been a bit of a challenge for these writers to write really complex and still unique personalities for all 68 playable characters across all three games without mm -hmm. DLC. Nearly double what was in Three Houses, including the DLC, and almost 20 more characters than Awakening, also including all its DLC. Though I don't even see these characters as shallow. To me, these characters, though basic, still seem super fun and entertaining, and throughout their support conversations, show a lot about them as characters. There is such a huge amount of options for support conversation, including the huge variety of supports per character. Though, with so many options, some are naturally going to be more impactful than others. Odin and Elisa's C support is, were you sleeping? No. Yeah. Though there are a lot of deeper and more revealing supports too, giving you not only extra customization from a gameplay standpoint, aka for the pair-up bonuses, but also more options for character interactions and cute in-game ships. S supports are a final support that can only be achieved once per character. Most games' S supports are limited to certain characters, but in Fates, nearly every character can get married to anyone of the opposite sex, at least from their respective kingdoms. There is racial tension. Again, all these options are really nice and give a lot more customization for your units, but with so many options, it can be hard to find pairings for certain ships. Hanoka and Hayato's entire marriage is based off origami. If only it was that easy. Some characters, like Niles, can even S-rank some members of the same sex. You lose out on some pretty cool features, like children this way, but hey, at least they give you the option, which is pretty neat. Whenever you have an S-rank couple, they can have a child, whose name, look, personality, and trauma depend on the father with the hair color of the mother. They will be sent to a place called a Deep Realm, a pocket dimension safe from the war where time moves a lot faster, so all these kids grow up to be enlisted to fight for your cause with stats and classes that depend on the combination of parents. And they say that crossbreeding people isn't ethical. But don't forget, there's a self-insert character in the game, and that self-insert character can marry anyone of the opposite sex, including those who can't marry anyone else. Out of this entire cast, your character is the only one Gunter can have a child with, and your character is also the only one that can turn into a dragon. Take with that what you will. This brings us into the other major complaint of Fates and Modern Fire Emblem, which is an emphasis on hot anime babes and dudes, and getting to marry said hot anime babes and dudes. You get to invite any of your units over to your one-bedroom apartment and talk. But if you're married, you can do more than talk, like kiss and blow on them. And in Japan, you can pet your wife. Is it a real relationship if you can't pet your wife? The games with emphasis on romancing these digital anime characters that has happened since Awakening is known as Waifu Emblem. And uh, it's there. I didn't have a problem with it. I get having skin everywhere can be annoying, but I'm no boob narc. And to many a lonely teenager, I'm sure hearing your anime wife say they love you is a shimmer of light in a dark tunnel. They can also make it worse when they die. I understand a lot of the fan service can be pretty weird. There's a weapon that lets you strip people when you stab them. And some of these marriage options are questionable at best. Considering that one of the main premises and selling points are your different casts of hot anime siblings, 
that could lead to some issues. Especially in Hoshido, because they are supposed to be your long lost siblings by birth, but lucky for you, if you try to S support any of them, they reveal that their mom said you actually aren't related by blood right before she died. I accidentally married these real cousins though. There's a lot of other moral problems that come up when marrying certain characters, like possible Stockholm Syndrome, gay conversion therapy, marrying a minor, Camilla. Camilla, the purple haired big titty Dom stepsister is just flat out predatory. Not only predatory to the player, because you can skip or ignore most of the sexual stuff if you don't want to see it. Camilla though, it's every fucking second. Even in the ending cutscene of Conquest, where you get to see the results of all your hard work throughout the story. They also play a drum sound as you bounce off your stepsister's tits. But Camilla is also predatory to the protagonist, as in Camilla and Corrin's S support, Camilla kind of implies that she was grooming her adopted brother. I told you this was like Sword Art Online. And these are definitely what I'd like to call more than fair criticism and reason to dislike the game. Of all the games I didn't think I could play in public, Fire Emblem was not on that list, besides for me getting beaten up for playing Fire Emblem. Besides the marriages. Looking at one to three mechanically sound games with great visuals for the time, fantastic music, and with so much customization and content, saying they are the worst due to a pretty out there story, or the fact it includes an option to date the characters, is a bit silly to me. If you only play Fire Emblem for the story or characters and these wild and colorful characters aren't your cup of tea, that's fine. But I don't believe it's worthy of sentencing a game to the pit for. I love this set of games, flawed as they may be. The gameplay is engaging and fun, and even if someone can't enjoy the in-game story, playing with permadeath could help with creating your own story. The characters and scenarios I find so outlandish, crazy, and fun, even whenever it's something so simple like Charlotte getting a crit and going, YOU'RE NOBODY, before cleaning their head off and then presenting her ass to her teammates. And there's no shortage of content here either. Bates brings you three entire campaigns, each with a lot of replayability and many DLC maps for extra challenge, rewards, rewards, and even extra side stories, like what if all the playable characters died, but their children remained. Even if it was a premise directly stolen from Awakening and not as thematically appropriate, it's still more stuff. And this g these games are something like I've never seen before and may never see again. And with all that, I think I'm finally ready to make my choice. I may have been tasked with a hard decision, but much like Corrin, I have to make my choice. Yes, I will upgrade to a large.